Good afternoon, everyone. I would just like to thank the organizers and Nova Nordus for giving me this opportunity to do this presentation. As you note, my presentation is titled Semaglutide and the Diabetic Landscape in 2021. This is my disclaimer slide. Now, with the advent of new innovative drugs such as GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors, we have managed to prevent or treat diabetic complications such as cardiac and renal disease better than ever before. The, the problem is that these drugs are costly. So every attempt should be made to make these drugs affordable and available to all patients. So my talk is basically on semaglutide, a once weekly injection, and the trade name being Ozempic, which is a long acting GLP-1 receptor agonist. This is my agenda and it is a long presentation, but I'll try to briefly discuss each one of the topics that I have listed below. With regard to the overview of type 2 diabetes, you will know that in 2019 data, you can see that diabetes prevalence is increasing worldwide. And in 2019, it was estimated that 463 million people had diabetes. And it has been projected in the year 2045 that there'll be an estimated 700 million people who will have diabetes. And you can note in some of the countries, it has doubled, like in Africa, it has doubled to 47 million. Now, in addition to that, the global incidence of diabetes, we are seeing an increasing in alarming rate with the COVID virus pandemic and the swear world being locked down. Now, there are many evils of lockdown, and you will note below that there are patients who are losing their jobs, they've been snacking, there have been no exercise, there are couch potatoes. You can see some of the slides which I presented showing you patients who are couch potatoes. There have been stress in the family, would the marriage and relationships have been affected as well? There's poor access to healthcare professionals, and patients are not renewing the medical store because of fear of contracting the virus. And one of the problems I've seen in practice recently. Yeah, many of the patients present to you and you check the blood pressure. Previously, the blood pressures have been normal. And then you try to determine the cause of the high blood pressure. And one of the factors I've noticed is that people are snacking on chips, they're snacking on popcorn, and they load themselves with salt and the blood pressures are uncontrolled. So this is one of the factors that has to be controlled. And you have to advise the patient about salt and the relationship to hypertension. Now, in addition to that, if you look at the COVID pandemic and diabetes, over a six month period in 2020, there were more than 6.6 million missed diabetes tests, including 5.2 million diagnostic and 1 million HP1 tests nationally, according to a retrospective study presented at this year's virtual meeting of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. The analysis estimates that these data represent approximately 690,000 missed prediabetes and 68,500 missed diabetes diagnoses, mostly type 2, with a resulting delay in lifestyle advice and treatment. Of those that missed HbA1c monitoring, it is estimated that more than 500,000 people would have had high HbA1c levels. Now, if you look at South Africa, and this is a report between the years of 20. 10 and 2019, and you can clearly see that if you look at the age-adjusted comparative prevalence of diabetes, it has risen from 4.5 in 2010 to 12.7 in 2019. And the proportion of people with undiagnosed diabetes at least about more than 50%. And if you look at the IGT, the impaired glucose tolerance, the prevalence has increased from 8.7 to 9%. So there are, this is a, almost a diabetic tsunami which hits South Africa. There are 3.5 million, about 6% of the South African population suffering from diabetes. Many more are undiagnosed. 
and it's estimated that another 5 million have prediabetes. And the highest prevalence is an Indian population, which is 11 to 13 percent, followed by the colors, the blacks, and the whites. Now, the question is asked what percentage of patients with type 2 diabetes die before the age of 60 in South Africa? It's shocking. You will know that 60 to 80 percent of the patients with type 2 diabetes die before the age of 60. Now, why is diabetes such a big problem for us? And the main reason is because of the fact that they have microvascular complications, such as diabetic retinopathy, which is a leading cause of blindness in adults, diabetic nephropathy, which is a leading cause of end-stage renal disease, diabetic neuropathy, which is a leading cause of non-traumatic lower extremity amputation, and the macrovascular complications, such as two, they have a two to four increase in cardiovascular mortality and stroke, and Eight to ten people, eight out of ten people with diabetes will die from cardiovascular disease. Now, there are a number of risk factors as well, and these are risk factors which we all know with regard to uh, the following, such as overweight and obesity, age, especially the risk increases in those over the age of 40 years, uh, in Caucasian and white, and over 25 years in the African Caribbean. The back African or South Asian groups. Obviously, the family history plays an important part with a genetic influence and ethnicity and hypertension as well. The hypertension risk increases by, the diabetes risk increases by approximately 2.5 times in those with hypertension. Now, if you know, uh, remember the mechanisms of hypoglycemia, this was the famous foursome. If you look at the beta cell, uh, there was a decrease in insulin secretion. If you look at the liver, there was an increased hepatic glucose production. The muscle, there was a decreased glucose uptake. And the adipocyte, where there was increased lipolysis. Then we came to the ominous octet, where four other mechanisms were added to the other four. And this was the GIT tract, where there's decrease in creatinine effect. The islet A cell, where there's increased glucose secretion the brain, where there's neurotransmitter dysfunction, and the kidney, where there's, where there's an increased glucose reabsorption. We now come to the Gregory's 11, where three more factors have been added to cause hypoglycemia, which is a colon, immune dysregulation, uh, the amylin in, in the stomach and wall, and, and the kidney as well. So this is why we call it the great 11. So the question arises, uh, how should we treat in diabetic patients? Previously, we were looking at the glucose centric and targeting mainly glycemic control. But it's clearly been shown that the multifactorial approach improves, improves outcomes, such as looking at the lifestyle modification, lowering of blood pressure and dyslipidemia as well. And therefore, if you're looking at all these factors, the management of diabetes and complications is improved. Complications are, are either uh, stopped or prevented further. And there are targets for each of these complications, such as HbA1c, physical activity, blood pressure, triglyceride, HDL, and LDL cholesterol. Now, the multiple risk factor intervention in type 2 diabetic patient microalbumina, which is a senior study, and this clinical target is a possible model for treatment of the multiple risk factors in the metabolic syndrome. And this is a set of two study. And if you look at the green was the intensive arm and the blue being the conventional therapy. And what they did, they looked at all the risk factors such as HbA1c targeting to less than 6.5, cholesterol, triglyceride, the blood pressure was targeted less than 30, 130, and diastolic got less than 80. And you will clearly see in green that the, the, uh, the, the uh, event rate was much lower in those patients who were on intensive therapy compared to the conventional therapy. And then putting it in another way, if you look at the composite endpoint of death from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal infarct, CABG, PCR, non stroke, amputation of surgery, you can clearly see with conventional therapy in orange and intensive therapy in green, 
the hazard ratio was 0.47, and the primary composite endpoint was reduced by 53%. And these were followed up for at least 96 months. Now, despite availability of numerous treatment, diabetes remains a challenge. Diabetes remains the ninth major cause of death globally. 54% of patients with type 2 diabetes have microvascular complications. 27% of patients with type 2 diabetes have macrovascular complications. And 25% of patients with type 2 diabetes have diabetic kidney disease. And in South Africa, diabetes is the second leading cause of death. And in addition to that, the hazard ratio for alcohol mortality is 1.8, and the hazard ratio for cardiovascular death is 2.32. Now, I'm going to tell you about the GLP-1 receptor landscape, and especially emphasizing that the talk is basically on semaglutide, but just to tell you a little bit more about the GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, which vary in molecular structure and size. These are the exenin-based GLP-1 receptor agonists, exenotide, which we know as Bieta and Xenotype, which is not available in this country, and the human GLP-1 analog, which are the small ones, Neuroglutide, which we know as Mectosa, and Semaglutide, which is the focus of my talk today. The larger GLP-1 analogs are Geroglutide, which has been uh, produced by, by Eli Lilly, and which is available as well, but the Albiglutide is not available in this country. Now, if you look at the results from the head-to-head -head trials, looking at the GLP-1 receptor agonist and HPA1C, and these are trials, all, these are all GLP-1 agonists ranging from the orange being the exenotide and, and the purple being neuroglutide, the red being geoglutide uh, 1.5 milligrams, right? And then uh, if you look at the blue, light blue, which is semaglutide 0.5 milligrams and the dark blue being semaglutide 1 milligram and then albiglutide and all these studies have shown. But if you look at the uh, reduction HP1C, if you concentrate on the GLP-1 agonist, right, that we are presently seeing, you can clearly see that both the, the semaglutide 1 milligram and 0.5 milligram show the better HP1C reduction compared to the other GLP-1 agonists. Similarly, if you look at the uh, body weight reduction, again, if you look at the sustained profile, sustained trials, again, the semaglutide in, in both the doses reduces the body weight. Now, there are numerous of, uh, new trials looking at the cardiovascular outcome, outcome with GLP-1 agonists in, in treatment of type 2 diabetes. And these are all trials, with, and some of them have been completed, right? And just to emphasize the fact that the leader where lidoglutide was used, sustained semaglutide, harmony with albiglutide, rewind with lidoglutide, the outcomes had demonstrated the cardiovascular reduction in high risk type 2 diabetic patients. Looking at the stepwise approach to type 2 diabetes treatment, this is a simplified pathway. And again, to emphasize that if you see a, a new diabetic, Lifestyle modification with diet and exercise plays an important part, and this should be emphasized at each visit that you see the patient. And with, with diet and exercise, you can decrease the HbA1c by 5%. But if the patient, has, uh, in, in addition to the lifestyle management, we always add metformin as a first-line treatment. And then if the patient has not reached target, then we follow the pathway whereby you add other glucose lowering medication if they haven't been used, and this follows the pathway, and then we can go right up to stage four, where a further escalation may require insulin treatment. But if you see the patient initially who has been a large modification and metformin and is at risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease or heart failure, the patient is suggested strongly suggested that this patient should be on a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGL-2 inhibitor. But unfortunately, uh, and, and this, the, the, this pathway is, uh, you should consider independently of the baseline hba one c or individualized hba one c target. This should be used earlier rather than later. But you've got to remember that there are other factors affecting choice of agents after metformin, which include the weight 
hypoglycemia and cost. Now, with regard to the mechanism of action of semaglutide, GLP-1 receptor agonists have multifactorial effects. It affects the pancreas and the beta cell, where the increase of beta cell function increases insulin biosynthesis. It acts on the liver, where there's decreased hepatic glucose production. There's decreased steatotosis. By that, I mean many of these diabetic patients, if you look at the liver, they may have a fatty liver with raised enzymes. And the GLP-1 receptor agonists have shown benefit in the fatty liver as well. Lipotoxicity is reduced. It acts in the brain where there's decreased body weight, there's decreased food intake and increased satiety. It acts on the pancreas with the alpha cell where it reduces glucagon and then GRT tract where it decreases gastric emptying. And in the kidneys, there's increased natural resources and in the muscles, there's increased insulin sensitivity. Now, the semaglutide is a human GLP-1 analog is 94% homology to human GLP-1, and the half-life is approximately one week. Now, the question is, why do we use a one-figure dosing? And this is a pharmacokinetic profile as stomach glucide at steady state, and you can clearly see that it reaches a plateau very early, and it maintains a plateau over a, a one week, over seven days, and the mean half-life is about 149 hours. That is why it's been used one weekly. Now, the benefits of semaglutide are as follows. If you look at the body weight, if you compare the placebo with the semaglutide arm, you can clearly see over a period of 12 weeks, there's a drop in, 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 in weight by, uh, by five kilograms with the semaglutide compared to placebo. And in addition to that, it's not only the body fat mass that decreases, it's also the body lean mass and you can see that with the semaglutide, body fat mass is decreased by my 3.5 kilograms and the lean mass by one, uh, my 1.1 kilograms. And this was a question I sent to the patient to see whether the patient, ha uh, what were the, uh, uh, if the patient had improvement in the control of eating and food craving. And you can see the list of questions which were asked. And it clearly shows to the left of this that semaglutide fed very strongly that the patient, did, the patient did favor using semaglutide compared to placebos. Now, one of the markers of, uh, of inflammation is a high sensitivity CRP. And in this study, it clearly showed that the CRP was reduced from 2.2 to 1.8 milligram over 56 weeks as well. In addition to that, the semaglutide improves prostatinidine lipid profile. You can see the reduction in triglyceride, reduction in the VLDL, reduction in the apoPRI48. There wasn't much reduction in free fatty acids, but you can, you can you will note the, 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 the improvement in the lipid profile as well. So to summarize, the uh, mechanism of action of semaglutide increase, increases insulin secretion and beta cell responsiveness. It suppresses hepatic glucose production. It reduces energy intake, food consumption, and body weight. It lowers postprandial lipids as well. Now I'm going to talk to you about the sustained clinical trial program. And this is, this is an extensive program looking at about 20,000 patients in 17 trials. And these were trials we're looking at uh, all the sustained studies, which were completed phase 3A, complete phase 3B, et cetera, cardiovascular outcomes, ongoing phase 3B and post authorization safety study, comparing it with monotherapy like cytokleptin or with SGLT inhibitors and with insulin, et cetera. And if you look at the baseline characteristics, the age range from 53.7 to 59.5, the, the, the HbA1c range from 8% 8, 8 to 8.4, and the body weight of 89.5 to 96.9. And if you look at the efficacy of sustain, again, as I showed you before, let's, we should concentrate on the GLP-1 agonist, and this is exenatide, dulucrutide, and dulucrutide, and you can clearly see the drop in HPOC is much greater with semaglutide 0.5 and one milligram compared to the other GLP-1 agonists. 
Again, similarly, the change in the body weight from baseline in this file, the, 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 the body weight decreased greater with 0.5 and 1 milligram compared to the other GLP-1 agonists as well. Now, if you look at subjects achieving HbA1c of less than 7% and less than 6.5%, if you look at subjects achieving HbA1c of less than 7%, clearly, again, the semi-glutide arms with 0.5 and, and one milligram showed much more greater benefit. And uh, um, many of, more of the patients reached the HbA1c of less than 7%. And if you look, if you look at the HbA1c of less than 6.5%, again, the semaglutide, the percentage of patients with semaglutide uh, reached this target better than the other TLP1 agonists. If you look at subjects achieving an A1c less than 7% without severe or blood glucose control, symptomatic hyperglycemia or weight gain. And again, the, the, the beneficial effects were shown with semaglutide compared to the other GLP-1 agonists. So if you look at the composite endpoints and other cardiometabolic parameters, which I haven't mentioned, is that semaglutide generally was associated with sustained and significant reduction in systolic blood pressure as well. It also consistently reduced fasting plasma glucose and postprandial glucose across these studies, suggesting both contribute to significantly better glycemic control versus the comparison. The weight reduction with semaglutide was principally due to the direct effect of semaglutide and not nausea or vomiting. One of the questions that's always been asked is, are these drugs safe? And again, if you look at the proportion of patients reporting DR adverse events, because as you know, uh, the most uh, common side effect with using the GLP-1 agonist is GI side effect like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And again, if you look at all the GLP-1 agonists, the, these uh, side effects were similar in comparison to semaglutide, exenatide, dilaglutide, and lidoglutide. The nausea-related events were also similar in all of these GLP-1 agonists. Again, if looking at severe uh, blood glucose confirmed symptomatic hyperglycemia, it was more than the same with all the GLP-1 agonists. So uh, in summary of those trials that we have seen, there's a consistent reduction in HbA1c fasting and post-primary glucose. There's a consistent reduction in body weight there's a reduced systolic blood pressure and improvement in overall lipid profile. And the overall safety profile was consistent with GLP-1 receptor antagonist class, agonist class. One of the uh, things that the FDA now asks all trialists uh, is that uh, the U.S. drug guidance on assessing safety of the new types of primary therapy. This was a concern in previous years, where, uh, previous years when rosiglitazone, the TZD was used in patients with diabetes, and they found increasing cardiovascular events with rosiglitazone. Therefore now, uh, they always ask to evaluate the safety of new drug for improving passive control, and either whether it's superior or inferior or beneficial or not. And the, if you look at the cardiovascular outcomes with a GLP-1 receptor agonist, these are varying results. If I can briefly go through of the, these ones, Excel, which has exenatide, there was benefit as well. Leader, which is later glutide, there was a benefit as well. Sustain six with semaglutide, there was benefit. Pioneer six was again oral semaglutide, which we have, which we will be seeing in the coming year. There's marked benefit. Rewind was dilaglutide, which showed benefit. But the only one that didn't show much benefit was exenatide or Alexa. Now, because of the FDA ruling, oh, I just want to concentrate on the sustained six trial. And the trial design was such that the inclusion criteria where patients had an HbA1c of more than 7% previously on was either or two oral antidiabetic drugs, basal or premix insulin. And they should be over the 50, year, 50 years of age, with established cardiovascular disease, prior cardiovascular event, stroke, et cetera or chronic heart failure and, and chronic kidney disease greater than stage three, or patients who are over 60 years of age with at least one cardiovascular risk factor. 
any trial information was that is, this was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, four-round parallel group trial, and the trial product was given in addition to standard care, standard of care and investigators were encouraged to treat according to local guidelines to achieve optimal glycemic control. And the key points where primary uh, endpoint was the time the first occurrence of death from cardiovascular cause, non-fatal microinfox or non-fatal stroke, and the secondary endpoint was time the first occurrence of each component. And this was a randomization, one milligram, 0.5 milligram compared to placebo one and placebo 0.5. And the duration of trial was 96 to 100 weeks, and there was a follow-up five weeks further on. So total treatment duration was 104 weeks. Now let's look at the outcome. The, if you look at the primary outcome, in fact, if you look at semaglutide in blue and placebo in the gray arm, you can see the hazard ratio for, for the primary outcome was the fact that there was a 26% relative risk, risk reduction of the primary endpoint uh, with semaglutide compared to placebo. If you look at the individual expanded composite outcomes, again, there was no difference in cardiovascular death, a non-fatal infarct, non-fatal stroke, and expanded cardiovascular, cardiovascular outcome was, uh, well, they showed benefit with semaglutide compared to placebo. Looking at the change in HbA1c, again, semaglutide in 0.5 and one milligram versus placebo, there was a drop in HbA1c, and the drop in HbA1c was 1.1 with 0.5 and 1.4 with semaglutide and very little with placebo. Again, changing in, a change in body weight. Again, there was a change, marked difference in body weight with the two semaglutide doses. And with 0.5, it was a drop in kilogram of 3.6, 4.9 with one milligram of semaglutide and placebo a very little weight loss as well. Now, if I can, uh, if we look at the change in systolic blood pressure again, there was a 3.4 millimeter drop with 0.5, 5.4 millimeter drop with one milligram semaglutide and very little with placebo as well. So there was a benefit in the systolic blood pressure as well. The property article where also the benefit showed there was a 36% risk reduction of nephropathy in patients with semaglutide compared to placebo. One of the problems that this trial had showed that there was an increase in diabetes retinopathy complications with semaglutide, the hazard ratio being 1.76, and there were the event rates were about 3% with semaglutide compared to placebo which was 1.8%. So the question was, how come, uh, what was the mechanism as to why this patient had increased in complications of retinopathy? And what they, <clears throat> they asked the question, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, <clears throat> did the change in hemoglobin A1C uh, cause a retinopathy complication? So they, what they did, they looked at the overall population and the change from baseline at week 16 and the change in baseline uh, uh, percentage point. And if you look at overall, the semaglutide 0.5 milligram and one milligram, there was a drop in HbA1c of minus 1.6 and 1.8, and very little with the placebo. But if you look at the subjects who, have, who had a retinopathy event, there was a greater drop in the HbA1c with 0.5 and one milligram from two to 2.5 drop in the HbA1c. So the reduction in HbA1c were greater in subject with diabetic complication versus the overall trial population. Then they looked at patients who had a ba who did not have baseline diabetic retinopathy, and those patients who had known pre-existing diabetic retinopathy, and then they looked at the incidence rate of first events per 100 patient years. And clearly you'll see the difference between the baseline diabetic uh, patient with no retinopathy, it was not no event. But in those patients who had pre-existing diabetes retinopathy, there were, there were events in the semaglutide arm uh, in, in these patients. So in patients with pre-existing retinopathy, 
the incidence of diarrhea complications showed a similar pattern between similar group type and placebo groups. An early worsening phenomenon has been noted in a DCCT trial where it showed that intensification of insulin therapy with a block improvement in glycemic control was associated with temporary worsening or diabetic retinopathy in this diabetes control complication trial in type 1 diabetic patients. So I've gone through the results of the retinopathy complication, and the current evidence does not support a direct role for GLP-1 receptor agonism via the GLP-1 receptor in the worsening of established diabetic retinopathy. Increased risk of the retinopathy complications were consistent with early worsening of pre existing diabetic retinopathy, secondary to initial rapid improvement in glycemic control. So now this is a study called the FOCUS study, and they will be looking at the, the mechanism as to why these patients had worsening of diabetic retinopathy with semaglutide. Now we've talked about trials, but we all, you should know that what is the real world evidence in using this drug? And this is the, it's called a SURE, which is a study designed in information. And this, uh, uh, this was a multi-center, prospective, phase four, non-interventional trial. And these kind of, the countries that were involved were mainly European countries. And the objective of the study was to investigate the effectiveness of one weekly semaglutide used according to local uh, clinical practice on glycemic control and other parameters of quality of life. The primary endpoint was a change in HbA1c from baseline to an end study. And this study lasted 28 to 38 weeks. And I'm not going to go to the baseline characteristics. Right. If you look at the hemoglobin A1c change from baseline and the target HbA1c of less than 7%, it varied from country to country from 0.8 to the maximum of 1.3. In addition to that, the proportion of patients achieving HbA1c of less than 7% varied from 46.9 to 69.5. And uh, similarly, the body weight change from baseline and weight loss response was greater than 5%, varied from 4.3 to 5.7%. And the percent proportion of patients achieving uh, weight loss of more than 5% ranged from 40.9 to 52.1 kilograms. Now, there are upcoming once weekly semaglutide trials in, in the future. And these are trials looking at the efficacy in additional settings uh, in cardiovascular effects, which to describe, which looks at the effects of peripheral vascular disease, the cardiovascular mode of action, the focus we already mentioned, the flow looking at the real effects, and remodel looking at real mechanism of action. And there are other effectiveness in real world setting trial like SURE, which I mentioned, and other prospective and retrospective database studies. The sustained forte will be looking at high dose semaglutide 2 milligrams as well. So the overall summary, the semaglutide provides consistent glycemic improvements. Uh, it results in significant weight loss. There was a significant reduction in overall risk of major uh, at the chronic cardiovascular event with a 26% reduction versus placebo. And it was well tolerated in both the sustained randomized trial and uh, real world age studies. And the GI adverse events were the most frequent adverse event with semaglutide. So to get to patients to go and prevent complications, one has to fight the system and for the patient as well. But you must remember that diet and lifestyle play an important part and the patient has to play the game, and this has, should be emphasized at every point. We should also educate the practitioners as to the new drugs available on the market to target the complication of diabetes and get good glycemic control. We should fight against the funders so that at least they can make these drugs available at a lesser price and, and also available for all patients to get to target and prevent complications and also to negotiate with pharma to bring the cost of these drugs down. So as I've shown, there's a better HbA1c reduction, there's cardiovascular benefits, no hypoglycemia, nephropathy benefits, and greater weight loss with the Zempic, which is one for all and all for one. And thank you for attending.